All right, uh, welcome back. If I sound frustrated, it's because this is the third time recording this class. Uh, I don't know what's going wrong. It, I record it, I go to save it, and then it won't play. So I did do it the other two times with video because I thought you would probably be missing my face by now. And I'm hoping that was the problem. So I'm going to move forward. And uh, unfortunately, you don't get to see my bright, shiny face in the bottom corner. But for most of you, that's probably going to be a good thing because I don't blame you. You know, uh, hey, look, at the end of the day, go to the first page, write down your objectives. I cannot emphasize how important it is as you read your chapter to treat those as questions and then write the answer down. That will help you study. Also, go over the key points at the back of the chapter once you're done. This will also help you study. So let's get started here, knowing that you got the objectives. And let's just jump into the material. Now, I apologize in advance for any background noise, like that dinging of the bell that's telling me that my wife's coming in the garage door, <clears throat> or one of my multiple grandchildren that my wife said would be safer here at our house than the large community of Gaylord. So, if you hear any loud noises in the background, or if I start screaming at a grandchild, please bear with me. Seizure disorders. Seizure disorders and epilepsy. Well, the epilepsy is related to seizure disorders. We'll get to the ep definition of epilepsy in just a minute. And I guarantee you she doesn't realize every time she opens that door that the bell goes off. That's the house alarm. Anyhow, <clears throat> seizures are problematic in that they can be caused by a multitude of underlying etiologies. What you have to do is you have to figure out what type of seizure this is and what is the underlying cause. Now that can be anything from a brain injury like a stroke or a TIA, transient ischemic attack, a cerebral vascular accident, CVA. It could be a tumor. It could be metabolic imbalance. It could be, you know, medications. It could be oxygen deprivation. It could be fever, febrile seizures, as you see that so often in small pediatric patients. So all of these can cause seizures to occur. Epilepsy, however, is a chronic disturbance of the nervous system characterized by various types of recurrent seizures that are the result of abnormal electrical activity of the brain. So it is this recurring seizures that gets you to the definition or diagnosis of epilepsy. And that should only be done by trained neurologist. So having a seizure does not mean you have epilepsy. That's important for you to understand. You need to be diagnosed with epilepsy. Now, having seizures, well, that's bad in its own right, but you still need to classify what type of seizures you have. And we have various types, partial seizures, generalized seizures. Some are just not classified at all. And then you can have what's known as status epilepticus. Now, status epilepticus is a grave condition in which the rapid unrelenting seizures occur over and over again. This is without a break. This can lead then to irreversible brain damage. So status epilepticus is a condition of seizures reoccurring seizure on top of seizure on top of seizure and if you can't break the cycle it can be literally life-threatening 
Now, I talked earlier about the classifications, and I said there are two types. you got partial seizures and generalized seizures. Partial seizures can then be broken down into three categories. The simple partial seizure, in which the consciousness is not necessarily impaired, but there are other motor sensory. This could be like a smacking of the lips, smacking of the lips, right? This is, is actually a, a focal point in the brain that is seizing, causing this autonomic response. It could be a complex partial seizure in which there is some impairment or loss of consciousness. Often, a lot of times, partial seizures will be mistaken for people daydreaming, just kind of like checking out for a moment. All of a sudden, boom, they're staring off into space maybe even simultaneously smack, smacking their lips. In reality, they're having a seizure. All right. And then, of course, you can get to the more involved partial seizures, which have larger foci or focal seizures, and this can result in a uh, localized um, seizure and it can actually progress all the way into generalized seizure disorders. Now, generalized seizures include um, absent, myoclonic, clonic, tonic, tonic-clonic, atonic, or infantile spasms. They actually involve the entire brain, where you have a electrical discharge of the brain, entire brain itself. It's important to understand the ones that you're going to see most often in the hospital setting that you're going to be familiar with is the classic tonic clonic. Now, this is where you have the tonic convulsions that continue uh, contraction of the muscles and the body spasms. All too often, people talk to you about different phases of seizures. One is the aura. Some people are able to sense a seizure coming on. They say they have an aura about them that they can feel it coming. Then they go into the tonic-clonic phase where they have the contractions and the seizing of the body it becomes very rigid. You can go into the grand mall tonic-clonic seizures that occur. And then that usually lasts for a very short period of time where it's complete unconsciousness complete loss of control of the body to include loss of uh, bowel and bladder function. And then they go into the postictal phase. The postictal phase is where a person then stops seizing. They almost appear asleep. They can have sonorous breath sounds and they start to wake up very confused, very drowsy. Okay, and then hopefully, hopefully, that's the end of the seizure. Now, how do we diagnose seizures? Well, we diagnose seizures, one, by witnessing them. Okay, so the witnessed account, the actual physical assessment. Another way is through diagnostic uh, interpretation, like EEG, electroencephalogram, or MRI, can actually see or witness the seizures occurring in the brain itself. How do we treat it? Well, we treat it through primarily medication and surgical intervention. Medication we want to use is anti-epileptic drugs or anti-epileptic medications. The surgeries we use are pretty complex. It's obviously brain surgery. We can put in we can uh, put in vagal nerve stimulators, which when the when it detects that the brain is starting to short circuit, it can stimulate certain areas of the brain and uh, actually stop the seizure in its tracks. So that's just uh, some of the types. If you look on page uh, 526, you can see uh, in box 23-1, these are some of your most common medications for uh, seizure disorders. The uh, anticonvulsant medications are probably the most common way to treat seizures. <coughs> Excuse me, this dry cough, runny nose, sore throat and fever have been killing me lately. Yeah, <laughs> terrible time to joke, huh? So, um, 
Yeah, everybody who thinks they just got a sinus congestion now think they have COVID-19 nowadays. Uh, luckily, there's nothing in our northeast region. Hopefully, it stays that way. So stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, so one of the things we want to do is we want to assess what type of seizure it is, find out what kind of seizure it is, uh, we observe the signs, make the proper diagnosis, get the patient on it. Now, I'm very familiar uh, in emergency room using phenytoin or phosphenytoin. Uh, those are your typical uh, anti-convulsant uh, uh, drugs that we use in the emergency situation. Also, we'll, you'll see us use, uh, often to help break, you'll see us use a uh, uh, usually a uh, medication, you know, like a uh, benzodiazepam. So some type of benzo will help uh, break seizure disorders like lorazepam. Um, Anyhow, <clears throat> moving right along. So you want to stop the seizure, especially you want to stop reoccurring seizures because you do not want status epilepticus. So then what you want to do is your immediate care calls for safeguarding the patient, stopping the seizure, or stopping the reoccurrence of multiple seizures. And how do you do that? And like I said, you do that with the anticonvulsants and the medications, the benzos. You also want to safeguard the patient. You do that by patting the bed, patting the side rails, patting the area, providing protection, especially protection to the head and neck. You do not restrain the patient. Restraining the patient can cause physical harm or injury. They can tear muscles, tendons, joints, or break extremities and limbs. They can actually break bones. You have to be very careful. You never try to force anything, especially you never try to uh, force an airway, you never try to force an airway open. Yes, you're going to take care of the patient with priority of care, airway, breathing, circulation, but just because they are seizing does not mean they are not breathing, okay? You do not try to force something down. You wait until the seizure is over and you treat the seizure with the anti-convulsant medications. Now, also remember, when it comes to medications, look at your clinical cues on page 527. You need to be aware that you never administer IV phenytoin at a faster than 50 milligram per minute. That can cause severe cardiac dysrhythmias. So this is a very um, dangerous medication if administered improperly. And you better know what you're doing when this is, this is, this is seizures are an emergent event in the sense that you have to break the seizure if it's reoccurrent. You don't want status epilepticus. But if you do it right and you safeguard the patient, okay, you don't have to panic. Oh, that's the thing. You need to learn to live with this. This is a long-term condition. Many patients have seizure disorders for the rest of their life. So they have to learn. That means a lot of patient education, patient teaching. For one, for self-care, if they're old enough and capable. And two, they also need to learn to identify those things that might set off their trigger or trigger their seizure disorder. And that way they can avoid those scenarios. And that's extremely important. They also need to safeguard themselves to not put themselves in a situation where if they were to seize at that moment, it would risk themselves or others. One thing in particular is driving. If you had a seizure disorder, yeah, technically by state law, you cannot drive. Uh, so if you've had a seizure, you're not allowed to drive for a set period of time. Each state sets their laws differently. I believe the state of Michigan is six months. That might be an interesting uh, Google fact. So that might be something you guys might want to go and GTS that. Okay, <clears throat> moving right along. Transient ischemic attacks, TIAs. Now, TIAs and CVAs, transient ischemic attacks, cerebral vascular accidents. All too often they're known as uh, mini strokes and strokes. TIAs are known as mini strokes and CVAs are known as strokes themselves. Understand this, a TIA and a stroke are identical in their etiology. They just differ in the severity. A TIA is transient, therefore it's temporary. So there are no residual deficits to the body. The body usually comes back to its normal baseline. 
the however the etiology is the same it is either caused by a blood clot right or a bleed so it's either non-hemorrhagic or hemorrhagic and that's the two types that you have to learn the signs and symptoms for both are very similar so and the risk factors for both are the same at the end of the day these are events that are caused by lack of oxygen to the brain that lack of oxygen is derived from either an blockage such as a clot or an embolus or a bleed such as a hemorrhagic so non-hemorrhagic versus hemorrhagic risk factors include smoking right diabetes high blood pressure hyperlipidemia which is high cholesterol sound familiar these are all the same risk factors that you have for coronary artery disease they're identical anything that can block a coronary artery and cause a heart attack can block an artery in the brain and cause a stroke so you have to be familiar matter of fact if you're at risk for heart attack you're typically at risk for stroke non-modifiable risk factors age race sex these are things that you can't control now <clears throat> let's just get to the real one that i want you to see right here fast you see this on billboards you see this on commercials you as a nurse need to understand this look at their face do they have facial drooping okay have them hold out their arms at arm's length ideally close their eyes do they lose balance and it does one arm drift down is one arm weaker is one side weaker do they have slurred speech and then finally t for time time to get to the emergency room because you have approximately three hours from onset of symptoms to the time that you can give anti coagulant anti um, coagulant medication these medications that you can give are medications like TMK TPA these medications will help to dissolve any type of clot in the brain so what do you have to do before you can give this medication you have to be able to identify what is causing the actual seizure is it from a clot a non-hemorrhagic or is it from a bleed obviously if you want to treat it you need to treat it properly so that if you in other words if the person was having a bleed you wouldn't give them something to dissolve the clot that would make the bleeding worse and he would kill the patient so antithrombolytic medications are only good for patients who have thrombosis who have non-hemorrhagic strokes now luckily the majority of strokes are non-hemorrhagic i think it's something like 80 some percent so the odds are definitely in your favor that it's not a bleed but if it is and you give a patient a uh, anti-thrombolytic and that bleed worsens you will kill them so what do you have to do you have to get them to a ct you have to get them to a ct to determine what type of stroke this is is this hemorrhagic or non hemorrhagic once the ct determines that then you can give them the appropriate medication and if you give them that medication within the appropriate time there's a good chance there will be no deficits and they'll fully recover from the stroke so that's why it's so important now diagnosis like i said the diagnosis is made by off a of physical assessment and it's usually fast facial drooping arm drift or weakness to one side of the body slurred speech time 
time to CT. Get the CT, get it done. Determine is it hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. If it's not hemorrhagic, then you can go ahead and give them the antithrombolytic medications right in the emergency room. Oh, surgical interventions include things like oh, angioplasty, which uh, you can see occasionally. That's also done for preventive. Uh, complications. Well, obviously, if it was a bleed, that'd be bad because you definitely don't want to give an antithrombolytic if it's a bleed. You don't want to give anticoagulants if it's a bleed. You don't want to do that because you don't want to do anything to cause more severe bleeding. Seizures, ongoing seizures, we said before. Uh, hemiparesis, apresis, uh, you know, paralysis to one side. Loss of speech or dysphagia. All these are complications of a stroke, depending on what part of the brain is affected. How you treat it, your initial care. Well, you treat it by supporting the airway, breathing, circulation. In other words, taking the life-saving measures, identifying what type of stroke it is, hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic. Non-hemorrhagic, you start the uh, antithrombolytics. If you're getting the one time, the safe time window to do so, which is, I believe, three to six hours. You might want to Google that because you're probably going to need to know it. <coughs> And then you can move into the rehab effort for recovery. If there are deficits, you might have to look at long-term care or continuity or continuity care. Uh, and our uh, ectar, uh, and our ectomy, uh, and our arterectomy. In other words, that's just the angioplasty of the carotids. Um, Basically, they go in and they uh, clean your carotid arteries out so that there's not a narrowing of the carotids because it doesn't have to be, a stroke doesn't have to occur in the brain. It's a lack of blood flow to the brain tissue. So anything along the path, now luckily the brain itself is a very redundant vascular net in the way that it go ahead and uh, will supply blood to the brain. And... Uh, I think we have a slide coming up. Also, don't ever forget your cultural considerations, race. African-Americans are 60 times greater at uh, risk for stroke than Caucasians. And you can see the different types. You can have a bleed through uh, something like an annual ruptured aneurysm. You can have an, a, an embolus as a clot, or you can have a narrowing or hardening of the arteries, and just a little blood clot would then go ahead and seal that off. So just like with the coronary artery disease, you can have the same things occurring in the brain. And you can see the opaque bleed on the left-hand side and how that is uh, going to interfere with the, uh, the brain itself. And this is what I was talking about, the redundancy. You can see you have the internal external carotids here. And as such, you can see you got multiple ways for blood to get up to the brain. What they don't show is once they get up to the top up there, they get that, they circle all the way around the circle of Willis. And that circle, that circle then supplies blood to the brain. So the brain itself has a very redundant uh, vascular net and blood supply. And that's what I'm talking about, the whole circle as the blood comes up and goes all the way around. So if one, one route gets cut off, blood can still get to the brain from the other avenues. Okay. Hemonopsia. Uh, this is a visual disturbance that you see uh, quite often with strokes and TIAs. Actually, my sister-in-law had this happen to her. She was at a baseball game with my brother. And all of a sudden, she turned to him and said, hey, Don, we have to leave. And he's like, why? What's up? She's like, I am blind. Literally, that was what happened. She just couldn't see anymore. She could see her feet, but she couldn't look up and see out. Uh, so um, this, and she was having a transient ischemic attack. Uh, and it, uh, oh, 24 hours later, she had her uh, sight back after they treated her. And uh, luckily, there was no residual effect. How do they treat? Well, they can go in and uh, if they think you have a potential aneurysm, they want to treat the aneurysm before it ruptures. So prophylactically, they can go in and clip it. You can see the, uh, uh, let me see if I can bring the little pointer down here. You can see that they can clip it. They can wrap it. Okay, this little wrapping it will help uh, 
strengthen it or they can do a coil. This is an interesting technique done with interventional radiology where they'll run a coil up into the aneurysm and then they'll just back this back and forth, back and forth, and they make this huge coil. And then the blood kind of coagulates and this all clots off. This forms a huge clot. And as the clot is formed right here, the blood continues to flow right by. Now, these two slides. Understand, if you have a stroke on the right side of your brain, it's the left side of your body that's going to be affected. If you have a stroke on the left side of your brain, it's the right side of your body. So people with right-sided weakness actually have a left-sided stroke. So that's important for you to understand and know. Moving on along, brain tumors, brain tumors. I already talked to you about cancer. I already told you how we treat cancer. We treat all cancer the same, period. We cut it out, we debulk it, make it smaller by radiating it, or we kill it with chemotherapy, okay? But at the end of the day, we still cut it out because we want cancer out of the body. Now, they might go and cut the tumor out and then they give radiation therapy. What they're doing is they're trying to kill any residual cancer cells that might still be in the, in the local area because they don't want it reseeding and re-popping up its ugly head. And that's the same reason they give chemo after cutting the cancer out. They want to kill it at the literally at the cellular level, down to the individual cancer cell. So they, they can also do site-specific uh, chemotherapy. And it's amazing what they can do nowadays with uh, interventional radiology right to the site of the tumor. Hydrocephalus. It's a complication of uh, brain tumors. Obviously, uh, intracranial and intracerebral hemorrhage is a complication. Intracranial pressure is a huge complication. Remember, I told you there's three things inside the skull, right? The brain, the blood, and the cerebral spinal fluid. The minute you start adding more things like a tumor, well, that's gonna take up space. Space that, well, quite frankly, does not belong there. So something has to give, and that is intracranial pressure goes up, and that's bad. Meningitis. You guys remember what the meninges are made of? It's made up of three layers that cover, protectively cover the brain and the spinal cord, the central nervous system. The meninges, the outer layer, is like a burlap sack, very durable. That's called the dura mater. The inner layer, very fine because it covers the brain and the spinal cord, very small, very thin very petite, almost pea-like, pea matter, pea, pea matter, goes against the brain. Then the two are connected with this strong fibrous connection. It's almost like a web-like connection. Webs make me think of spiders. Spiders are arachnoids, arachnoid matter. Those are your three layers of meninges. Now, the inflammation of the uh, meninges themselves can be caused by bacterial infection or viral infection. So it doesn't matter. It's just an inflammation. Meningitis is the inflammation of the meninges. You have to figure out <clears throat> what is it that's causing the meninges to become inflamed? Is it bacteria or virus? How do we find this out? Well, the one gold standard is the spinal tap. We do perform a spinal tap. How do we Determine whether or not the patient warrants a spinal tap. Well, we look at the patient and we look at their physical signs and symptoms. Do they have a fever? It's going to be a very high fever if they have meningitis. Do they have a headache? Do they have nuchal rigidity? That is stiffness of the neck, pain. It hurts them to literally put their chin to their chest. It causes pain. They have a severe headache. I had meningitis when I was young. I actually missed my wedding because the day before my wedding, I was hospitalized with meningitis. Uh, I was hospitalized for almost uh, two weeks. I was very sick. The uh, friend I caught it from actually died the day of my wedding. So <clears throat> I can tell you, um, it's a very dangerous uh, disease. And for anyone who's interested, I got married in a hospital. I was in a wheelchair. The wedding went on uh, without me. Anyhow. Uh, in addition to nuchal rigidity, you need to understand uh, what Brzezinski and Kernig sign is. Now, the Brzezinski sign and the Kernig sign are found on page 544, the top left-hand corner. 
And you can see a, pos a positive Brzezinski sign is when a passive flexion of the head and neck causes flexion of the thighs and legs because they want to relieve the pressure on the spinal cord because it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt them if you move the neck up. So they move, the, they move their legs up to relieve that pressure. So know what a Brzezinski and a Koenig sign is when it comes to uh, meningitis. Now understand that bacterial meningitis obviously is going to be treated with antibiotics, massive antibiotics. And viral meningitis actually is treated symptomatically because much like all viruses, they have to run their course. There is no therapeutic regimen. So we just treat it, uh, the symptoms best we can, and hopefully they survive. Uh, but one advantage is there is a vaccine for the viral meningitis. Now, anyone who's in college or close proximity to other people like uh, dorm, life, barracks, living, army, military, uh, college, they should take the meningitis vaccine. I believe it's a requirement actually for college students. Uh, so once again, uh, anti-vaxxers uh, get off that bandwagon and join the vaccination crowd because vaccines save lives. That's why they were rushing so hard to get a vaccine for the COVID-19 right now. So understand that. Okay, and here's those, uh, the Brunig and um, Koenig sign. The Koenig sign is the uh, bottom one, the, um, the, what, the Brzezinski is the top. <clears throat> I've already talked to you about uh, viral meningitis. It runs its course. It's self-limiting. So just uh, understand that you have to treat it symptomatically. And people can get extremely sick from this. Encephalitis. Encephalitis is the uh, inflammation and swelling of the brain. Now, this is also usually virus-driven. Uh, typically, the uh, virus is, can be chickenpox, measles, mumps. But hopefully, uh, if we got a good vaccine, uh, that's been limited. Uh, ticks and mosquitoes are vectors. This is vector driven. So a lot of times these, these uh, illnesses will be passed on through mosquitoes like Japanese encephalitis, like our West Nile syndrome. These, these, cause, uh, these viruses still cause encephalitis, which can cause death. And they are passed on through insects. So we need to control that insect, that vector population. Signs symptoms are very similar to meningitis, a stiff neck, photophobia, lethargy, fever, um, could be seizures, uh, flaccid paralysis, depending on how far the virus has progressed. What they're going to do, the well, diagnostic studies are going to include a, um, a basically physical assessment but the biggest diagnostic study you can do is spinal tap still. Treatment, uh, treat the underlying etiology. If it's viral in nature, there's not much you can do. You can maybe uh, do some antiviral medications, but mostly you're going to treat it symptomatically. Uh, well, you know, one thing you can do is try to prevent it uh, during mosquito season or insect. Or if you're outside, wear proper protective clothing, use uh, insect repellent. And if you can, uh, use insecticides just to kill those little buggers. Migraine headaches. Migraine headaches are now obviously are a real thing. Migraine headaches are uh, more often seen in women than men, and they are extremely debilitating. Anyone who has seen someone come into your ER with a migraine headache will quickly realize that, uh, that this is a serious account. These uh, women who come in are, uh, usually they'll come in, you know, They'll, especially if they have a history of uh, migraine, they'll be wearing sunglasses, they'll be holding a bag because there's nausea, vomiting, it's uh, light sensitivity. Um, they are in severe pain. I mean, uh, these attacks can occur with uh, regular uh, symptoms can last up to 72 hours. What you have to do is you have to get them to a dark, quiet, order-free room because odors can trigger. and I've found really good luck in just snowing these patients, putting them to sleep. You know, you can treat with uh, your typical migraine medications, which you can find on box 23-2 on page 547. But I've found things to really help is just, you know, getting them put out and uh, snowing them, in other words, uh, as best you can. 
uh, they need to identify what their triggers are. Sometimes the triggers can be alcohol, caffeine, chocolate, uh, MSG, and then they need to avoid. Um, also menstruation. Uh, some women get headaches uh, in correlation with their cycle, so that could be a problem as well. Cluster headaches. Now this is where we get the headaches for men. Men have uh, cluster headaches more often than women. They usually only last uh, 30 to 90 minutes, a lot less time than a migraine, but I can tell you right now, men don't handle these well. Well, obviously, I got a, I, I've got a theory that men don't handle pain as well as women. I could be wrong in that, but that's just been my observation uh, over numerous years in the emergency room. Uh, I can tell you, uh, guys who come in with these type headaches, man, they're in extreme pain. It's a short duration, but you would never know it. You would think they're dying. Uh, it's usually one side unilateral and it's periorbital. It's around the eye. And they'll tell you sometimes it feels like someone's sticking a knife right through their eye. Uh, finally, tension headaches. Now, tension headaches can happen in both sexes. This is usually caused by stress. Not that you guys would know anything about stressful environments. Uh, the thing here is you really have to kind of relax the neck and the neck muscles. You, they get the headache along, going right up their neck into the back of their head. And um, obviously you're gonna treat the headache, but you got to also treat the underlying etiology, which is the anxiety itself. Cranial nerve disorders. There are two big cranial nerve disorders we're gonna talk about. One is the uh, trigeminal neuralgia, which is a pain. It's severe facial pain. It can last only for a short period of time. It's usually unilateral in nature, and it's a trigeminal nerve. Now, that differs from Bell's palsy. And I'll tell you this, Bell's palsy is the facial nerve. They believe there's a connection to uh, viruses that might cause the facial nerve to respond in such a way. But the re underlying result is still a droopy face. The face will then droop, the mouth will droop. That can result in a slurred speech. Any of these things sound familiar? Exactly. Bell's palsy will mimic a stroke or a transit ischemic attack. I'll tell you right now, when in doubt, err on the side of caution and think it's treat it as a stroke treat it as a stroke until you have ruled a stroke out regardless of the age i don't care if this is a young kid and you think oh this is just bell's palsy until you have gotten that ct it is a stroke the difference between the two is you're obviously not going to have the weakness or the arm drift because it's not a stroke, it's a facial nerve issue, but you don't know that. So treat it as a stroke until it's ruled out. All right, I think that covers my entire chapter on uh, disorders of the brain. So this is the only chapter we're gonna cover this week. Good luck and uh, keep in touch. Talk to you later, bye.